Okay, so uh, we are live now. Is everyone online? Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, so the topic that we have for discussion uh, for this panel is, you know, we often have, rather too often nowadays, we have a very divisive us and them constantly battling against each other. And uh, it's been now, you know, the statement that united we stand and divided we fall is being proven more and more correct. And, you know, how can we be inspired to creatively work together? How can we achieve this in a post-COVID world, uh, which is unfortunately growing increasingly inward looking? And most importantly, you know, more than policies and more than uh, what is happening in every other sphere, how do we refashion our individual attitudes to, you know, come together and do something, you know, to restore some kind of normalcy? Because uh, even on a political level, leaders world over are starting to look, you know, more and more inwards. Trend, this trend is continuing, and unfortunately, the sentiment has trickled down to large sections of the population. So, you know, what, what all can we do to work together? Like they say, uh, unprecedented times requires unprecedented thinking and solutions. So as a human race, can we achieve this? On the panel, uh, we have uh, Evan Insir. Evan is a member of the European Parliament from the Swedish Social Democratic Party. She's a member of the LIBE, AFIT, and DEV committees in the European Parliament and focuses primarily on democracy, human rights, and the respect for the common values of the Union. She has been engaged in politics and the strive for democracy locally, nationally, and globally. Before her election to the European Parliament, she was Deputy International Secretary for the Swedish Social Democratic Party and has also been Secretary General of the International Union of Socialist Youth. We also have Ricardo Vargas, who is a chief advocate in the project economy. He specializes in implementing innovative global initiatives, capital projects, and product development. Ricardo has directed dozens of projects across industries and continents and has managed more than $20 billion in global initiatives over the past 25 years. We also have Venkat Maturi. He's a policy influencer and business advisor with business and consulting experience across India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. He has over two decades of consulting experience and has been responsible for several business restructurings, turnarounds, and has also advised a lot of corporations on mergers and acquisitions and post-merger integration. He has won several accolades and has successfully scaled for-profit and non-profit education ventures. I would like to first uh, ask, you know, we'll just go alphabetically. So I would like to ask uh, Evan to begin the session. Evan? Do you hear me now? Yes, I guess. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. And you hear me. Both see me and hear me. That's the normal phrase in the European Parliament nowadays, uh, since many are connecting from uh, different countries and so on. But thank you very much for the invitation to this very timely and very important um, discussion. I would say that, I mean, the international solidarity and the importance of working internationally has for me always been a very um, important issue. And I also think that it's always been actual, but uh, now with the COVID-19, it has even become more important. Um, and uh, now, uh, since ever, I would say that our multilateral system also plays a super important role. The many of the multilateral systems, as EU and the UN, was put in place after the Second World War in order to prevent uh, history, the bad part of the uh, terrible part of the, um, our history, to repeat again. But unfortunately, uh, we see that there are voices growing, both Euro in Europe and beyond who are uh, questioning 
um, this multilateral system that I, I want to highlight that it has served us well for so many years, for over 70, 75 years. It has prevented uh, escalation of conflicts. It has prevented, um, uh, it has prevented uh, history to repeat itself in, the, in that extent uh, as it did for, for 70, 75 years, not at least in the region uh, where I am in the European Union, in Europe. Um, so I think that this current development is, uh, is, um, has, uh, or the current situation or the, the, the situation we live in has a lot of challenges. Um, and we see also, I mean, two different parallel things happening. On one hand, uh, we see more and more people taken out of poverty, for example. At the same time, we see inequalities grow, uh, growing. So it's quite a lot happening at the same time. We see also, unfortunately, forces and uh, important um, players on a global level as U.S. taking step back from the multilateral system and questioning it and going hand in hand with forces that I would not want to see uh, are the leading, would be the leading forces globally. And uh, I, for example, take uh, I, I just mentioned the U.S. has withdrawn, for example, from some of the U.N. Uh, organizations. And I think right. it's quite pity, um, not at least during this time of COVID-19. So here I think the European Union finally has a quite important role to play. And they here uh, I, would, I would say that the European Union, we need to uh, sharpen our tools uh, for decision making, because right now, on when it comes to the foreign policies, uh, quite a lot needs to be. Uh, all the member states needs to um, be on the same page and agree on them. But I think we need to go from this uh, unanimity to some kind of uh, uh, majority or qualified majority decision making to be the the player and the, and take on the role that the glo that we uh, we right now are missing globally. Thank you. Great. Uh, so, Evan, uh, since you are part of the European Parliament, can you can you give us, you know, like examples from Europe uh, of instances of at least efforts, you know, to unite and try and come to a common consensus for the good of all, hmm. especially during this crisis? First of all, to be frank, what happened in the beginning of the crisis I would mm -hmm. say was uh, was uh, shameful. Many member states um, freestyled, uh, took their own paths, and there was no real coordination. But quite fast after um, the pandemic uh, started, mm -hmm. uh, the Parliament and the Commission put quite a lot of pressure hand in hand with some of the member states on some of the EU member states who were, for example, uh, preventing. Um, uh, medical supplies to go from one country to another and so on. So the pandemic, which is a, a, a regional and a global, more also a global um, uh, issue, it, when there is a crisis that hits and is not on a national level, is a regional or globally, it says it, it, it says it itself, we need to solve it then also on a regional or on a global level. However, after a short time, the Parliament and the Commission and some of the member states put pressure and we managed to coordinate ourselves. And I would say that uh, the way that the member states now have started to, uh, to cooperate um, has been quite successful, even though we are not 100% there. Um, mm -hmm. We know that, for example, what happens, for example, to the companies in one part of the region is going to affect, of course, the other part. What happens to yeah. people in one part of the union will happen to other parts. Uh, will affect people in the other part of the union and so on. So I would say that um, the cooperation that took place short after the pandemic uh, hit us all globally um, uh, became quite successful, even though it started up not that successful. Okay. And do you see this cooperation uh, strengthening going forward? Um, it... it in, at some point, I was a bit uh, worried uh, because it would have depending totally if we would have managed and if we still are man managing, will be managing to take ourselves together, both in Europe but also globally, out of this pandemic. If we don't mm -hmm. do that, then this will fuel the uh, the the forces who are uh, qu question. Um, uh, constantly questioning the multilateral system and said that it has played out its role. We should 
um, we should dismantle uh, the, uh, the multilateral system and we should focus on national system. And of course, I'm referring this to uh, national, nationalistic forces within Europe and beyond. So, uh, and I have become more positive uh, that, uh, that our way will be strengthened uh, but it's still some way to go before before we can totally uh, win this um, this uh, political struggle. But once again, it's important to underline that a pandemic, a crisis that doesn't see any border, cannot be solved with national solutions. Correct, correct. Thank you so much, Evan. That was uh, very very insightful. Um, Ricardo, can we have have you next? Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's a it's a great honor for me to to be here, and I, I want just to add to what uh, Erin said uh, on on two different perspectives because I had my life on the private sector, but also five years uh, leading the project management and infrastructure at the UN. So I had to see this both sides on 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 the environment. And let let me tell you, I, I think that we are living today a very different time but also a time of individual and group reflection. Because, uh, you know, uh, things are, are so different today. For example, today, when we see the use of facial masks in parts of the country, became a political decision, not a health decision. Means, you know, I heard people saying, oh, you, uh, for example, I'm Brazilian, okay? I'm Brazilian, I live in Europe. You know, you wear masks, oh, you are from the left. You are from the right. You are from this group. You know, people start disconnecting from reality that we are living in a very tough ep epidemic and it's not a political game. So, for example, when a global leader starts saying, you know, this is all fake news. This is not true. What is going on? Uh, the numbers of coronavirus are not real. Some people think this is the truth. And I think that we need to go back one step and reevaluate what is the leadership because what is missing today, and it's not just for government, it's leadership. So we are living an unprecedented crisis of leadership, you know, and people and mostly the poor people, the people that could not uh, get to the job, that people that really cannot protect themselves properly, they are completely lost. So we, we can see this in so many different parts of the planet. And, and we need to get this real. So going back to the lines here, is stronger together as us and not them. We need to understand that it's in our own best interest to work together. And, and there is no way, there is no way U.S. or Brazil or Europe will sort out this problem and go out of this crisis alone. There is no way, no matter what you do, no matter if you close your borders, no matter if you work only locally, it's not, it's not. And we can see that the virus has no border, you know, the virus has no preference, you know, the virus is just the virus, you know, and, and we need to, to know that because a lot of people are suffering dramatically from that. And not only on the health side, but, you know, uh, some people are so unprotected because there is no absolutely no social net to protect them. And companies are, uh, I'm, I'm telling, uh, in the most extreme versions of capitalism, companies are just dumping people out, thinking that, and, and I said this last year uh, uh, on at the Drucker Forum, I said this, you know, we need to understand that it's only one ecosystem. So, and I said, when you think that your solution is... Uh, removing 50,000 people from your workforce, then you can save. You need to understand that you, they are still part of your ecosystem and they will come back. I'm saying it's in the, it's in the benefit of companies, corporations, government, society that we keep a health environment, that we keep a uh, uh, solidarity and have more humanity on that. For example, uh, uh, Irving, Irving, uh, when I heard you saying about the supplies during the crisis, it's shameful to see people, you know, saying, oh, how much do you pay for the facial mask? I pay twice. And, and you know, 
thinking that, you know, let me, and, and this, I saw one question here about, uh, from Adam about tribalism. We really need not only to, to define uh, our politics, but we need to understand what we want for our society, you know? And this is bigger. And this is why it, it sometimes is scary when we see what we are seeing today. And COVID is just an example of, of this extreme uh, visions we face today. In fact, Ricardo, this is something I wanted to ask that this is this is not really just about COVID, is it? Like there's a world beyond COVID and this inward looking attitude and unilaterally deciding to do things without any consensus globally. It's something that might is is something well beyond COVID, right? And well before COVID. Uh, absolutely. COVID uh, is just a spark that is detonating everything. But you know, the, the word from... Uh, several years is is deteriorating its ability to work together. And this is why we see this extreme movements uh, everywhere, that we see this lack of inclusion, that we see discrimination, that we are surprisingly seeing in some places a, a dramatic increase of racism. You know, yes. and, and we thought that, okay, this was part of our past, And then but now it's such a life today when we see, you know, people phrasing white supremacists and this kind of thing. This is really, really scary. And COVID is just the spark for this kind, uh, this kind of, uh, of environment that we, we don't know what do we want for our future, you know. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, Venkat, we'll come to you now, just because we were going alphabetically. So. <laughs> Absolutely, perfectly fine. Uh, I just want to reconfirm that you're able to hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can hear Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's very interesting that uh, uh, you know, we come from different parts of the world. And uh, uh, when we st start sharing our views, we start to be reflecting similar thoughts. And that's that's a very pertinent uh, point that we should always keep on attention. Uh, while the topic says that you know, the world is getting a bit divided, uh, and uh, somewhere in the topic there seems to be an assumption that we we also need to look for an alternative. Now the question is, uh, do we have a critical mass in the world which is looking for an alternative, or it's not looking for an alternative? I think that's also a big question mark. That's when uh, you know, whether we have the critical mass is what is going to define whether any brilliant idea is going to actually gain any kind of momentum or not. But that being said, I think there are certain very strong positives that are coming out with the experience of COVID. And incidentally, uh, COVID has certainly become important, primarily because it's endemic. Everybody is exp experiencing the, the difficulties of COVID and also the helplessness. Now, Uh, when I when I go across and speak with different friends from around the and the world, uh, what's very interesting is it doesn't matter whether you are the topmost and the largest economy in the world or you are the bottommost economy in the world. Both economies seem to be as helpless. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so U.S. didn't have anything uh, uh, more advantages or disadvantages compared to say India in terms of say population or resources or. Uh, even if I were to get into some of the micro uh, markets or micro regions within India, it, it wasn't as though Delhi or was made a better place than Dharavi. So we have to be, we, and plus we, we could see how responses within the urban slums are much better than what everybody expected. Now the, the, now the important point is primarily the world is driven by economic interests, whether it's an individual level, whether it's an institutional level, or whether it's a systemic level. We are all existing here for our well-being. Till now, and I'm sure even for the foreseeable future, most of the decisions in the world have been managed with the institutional frameworks, the United Nations or the World Health Organization, which is another United Nations organization, or the regional conglomerations or, or the political affiliations or whatever, the, whatever the, that you have to say. Now, uh, suddenly things are not working because of COVID. And you also realize that... Um, All the wherewithal that we amass till now, our militaries or economic might, etc., is not probably going to offer a quick solution. And uh, in part, I would say, you know, 
the first reaction that we see from various governments or various decision makers across the world is not exactly a very educated or very aware response. It's a very reactive response because we do not know when there's a crisis. The first thing that you try to do is protect yourself. Yeah, uh, but there is a certain wisdom that's growing. There are certain things that the world has also done. And uh, for example, uh, Europe si significantly relies on travel. The whole European model, for example, is about um, free travel and easy movement. But if that mice itself is questioned, then we would also have to wonder as to whether these philosophies are going to work any further. However much may we want those philosophies to work, there may be certain operational limitations. Yeah. Now, the question is, we go back to the original original pursuit all of us have, which is economic well-being. And then we go back to the topic as to how do we make sure that we are not uh, pursuing with economic well-being, which continues to divide us more. Therefore, what may be the solution? And, and uh, till recently, till before COVID, I would have not got convinced that the world is looking for an alternative. But now everybody seems to be looking for an alternative. I do not know what is the solution they're looking for an alternative, but everybody seems to feel that something is not right and we need to do something different. So here's, here's, so therefore, is there a solution? I think there's a solution. And is there a solution that the world understands? I think the world understands. So how do I connect economic well-being and making sure, as Evan mentioned, uh, I, I certainly drawing the blank on the term that is something, something the effect of uh, weighted, uh, some, something she, she, she indicated to the extent of how do you give relative weightage to different populations around the world? And that's where, uh, you know, how do you make sure opinions are counted? And that's where divisions will be invalidated. The only way opinions will be counted is if in my life, whether I'm a person or an institution or a country, anybody else in the world is indispensable to, to explain. If there is a country, let's say 188 on the economic ranking, if say, let's say that's maybe 1% of US economy, let's say, how do you make a country like US or a country like India uh, factor another country which may not be as big or in uh, economically or geographical, let's say, they must be indispensable in my own existence. And that indispensability has to some way connect back to economics, because unless there's a connection back to economics, nobody in the world is going to listen. And I think that's that is all the, that is the model in my view. At some point in time, we need to pursue. How do you make the the world is already interdependent, but that interdependency is also very skewed. How do you make this interdependency much more balanced? The world did experiment with this model in a way, in a very roundabout way, when when some of those climate protocols were trying to, were being negotiated, when we are trying to find a role for every region, if not a country. And that way you were trying to uh, manage or control growth, but somehow that didn't work because the, uh, the pushes and pulls were pretty strong. But since then, when the COVID has happened during the climate protocol negotiations, many, many countries who are economically well off, they thought they would have better leverage. The COVID makes us all realize that economic, uh, you know, despite our economic size, the leverage is not so significant. Even eventually it can, it, it can help, but not, not entirely. I think I think that's the initial thought I would like to kind of place, and then of course, as we proceed to the discussion, I have some more thoughts to share. Sure. Uh, so, Venkat, since since you were talking about this, I just wanted to ask you that you, since you said that you know opinions need to be heard more and more mm -hmm. opinions need to be heard. Now, mm -hmm. people who have, really have a voice across many countries, where you know where we see the rise of populist leaders, mm -hmm. people who really have a voice, they are not really being heard, you know, and these are these are educated people or, or they are feeling scared to come out and talk about things which are essential to be spoken about, but they are not mm -hmm. doing it as frequently as it was done before. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, what do you think about that? The definition of voice has to be understood. If, a, if, a, if, a, uh, let's say if a, a Bollywood actor wants to have a political voice, then uh, or have a voice. Now, the question is, does the person want to have a political voice or does the person have want to have a voice? Because as in, in his or her capacity, they definitely influence huge masses uh, through their, in, in, they already do that. Now, the question is, do you want to compete in a different space? And if you are competing in a different space and then say, I don't have my voice being heard. So we need to wonder about it because if, if you have to look at an educator in a college, 
then he or she is educating at least on an average 40 to 50 new minds every year then he or she is actually making sure her voice is being heard or his voice is being heard at least by 40 50 more people now if that educator complains that i am not being heard at a political discourse well all of us contribute to the larger thought process in our own capacities if you all want to have space at the same platform then we also need to, i mean i i mean evan has a her platform i have my platform ricardo has his platform you have your platform now if we, if we, if i suddenly want to get onto evan's space and say no, i want to have a voice as evan has well then i need to walk the same path which evan has walked simple as that uh, i need to be i need to also go through the same route i just can't suddenly say that no well she has earned her path in her own way and i can i cannot suddenly say that no sorry uh, no no i i also need to have the same path so we we also need to be a bit cognizant about what is the definition of voice i think we lost uh, sort of yeah let, let me let me uh, just add to to your point i think you were perfectly right we and we have an additional problem today is that there is such a big manipulation of what truth is today you know and this for me is very scary because you uh, people many of these populist leaders or or people they are benefiting from the fragility of the people mm-hmm. to, to sell this divisive speech you know this divides it it's you know you are getting uh, you are losing your job you are feeling pain because someone stole that from you and this is uh, this is really a, a massive problem today a massive problem because uh, people today it's very hard today to have a positive discussion on on several topics because people are just you know it's like a brainwash about what the situation is about and this is happening in many parts of the uh, of the world and i think we need to fix that in order to make people have a more clear view on what the future looks like mm-hmm. maybe also i could add uh, something on that i i agree to some extent but i at the same time think that one of the biggest challenges is that say that far right movements and uh, those uh, questioning for example the cooperation and um, the nationalistic uh, forces are rather their their messages are simplified they are easy while we who uh, who uh, who um, believe in democracy who believe in rule of law believe in fundamental uh, rights believe in multilateral system uh, as the protector of the fundamental rights uh, both the civil but also of course social rights because in the end if people feel that it's becoming worse for me then it is easy for these forces to actually as so the extreme forces to say look the problem lays in that your money goes to for example the immigrants who are coming to your country and and so on and so on and fuels anti uh, uh, anti racist uh, sentiments or oh, sorry racist sentiments um xenophobic sentiments so we have quite a huge um, huge um, um uh he he challenged in front of us i i will take one example during the uh, elections uh, in in both the eu elections but the also national election we had in sweden last year and the year before but during the eu elections uh, we were out and knocking doors and of course presenting our platform talking to uh, people um and then one an old lady opened the door and we had a conversation one of the first and i asked her so have you decided uh, if you're going to vote her first reaction was of course i'm not going to tell you and this was not what i was asking for of course my question was just if i could answer question as social democrats uh, if she had any questions to us not wanting to know what she's going to vote for <laughs> nevertheless um what the one of the or the second or third things she says was they are coming here and stealing my uh, laundry time because in the building she was living in they have a common laundry in the in a, um, a common laundry and then i started to ask her well didn't people maybe steal each other's laundry time previously also it's not i mean the first or maybe the last time this will happen to anybody even though of course it's not good from going from discussing this we ended up discussing yes these things have happened before but her biggest problem was she has it worse uh, her pensions is not enough is not enough uh, she cannot pay uh, the rent at the same time as having food on the table and so on and so on and we know i mean the 
inequalities are growing in the societies, both in Europe but also globally. And this is something that we really need to um, need to address. And uh, yeah, as I'm biased right now, but that's also for me uh, as a social democrat why the social rights are so important and they need to go hand in hand with, of course, the democratic and the civil rights. Uh, and we need to be able also uh, to show um, to simplify our messages of why these things are important um, and not give uh, give the far right movement the possibility to put the agenda or give the solutions. So we have also, as the democratic forces, a responsibility here. Absolutely, I mean, I think I resonate with you. I know the 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 story has become very complicated the moment you go beyond the national boundaries and you know. It's, it's easier for one to relate what they see and hear. And it's a bit difficult to relate to things which you may not have an individual or a personal experience. But, but that being said, I think uh, that's where the challenge is for uh, all of us is uh, how do you simplify narratives? Uh, the fact is we all know that uh, we are mutually dependent on anybody and everybody in the world. I mean, uh, COVID itself, going back to the same example, we know the vaccines is, is going to be a challenge. So there will be different countries who need to come together to be, kind of ramp up those vaccine capacities. And the idea is how how much do we take uh, these examples and simplify the narratives and convey it to everyone? Because that's what is going to set the base case. But then um, the other point being, uh, there is a, a very big, massive silver lining that I see in COVID which is the playing field is getting leveled in a very different way. So many of many of those uh, initiatives or many of those efforts to find a more efficient and a more effective model, which was uh, most of the energies were, were invested in trying to showcase the cons of the earlier models and then showcase the pros of the new models. You suddenly realize that COVID has already accelerated those processes. So it's kind of getting very simple. And then, and people do understand that, uh, you know, economic pursuits alone, which were the which were probably the objectives of many of the earlier models, which led to many prosperous countries. And when they see that those countries are also facing the same problems, people may want to question back as to saying, what's more important in life? And do we want to hold back to some of those uh, um, ideologies which may or may not work? Maybe this thing, things can go uh, more easier, given this experience all of us are going through. Yeah, I, I, I will just uh, take a lead here because Shivani uh, is not here. So I, I have one. Uh, Adam just put a question. Um, he said, as long as our measure uh, is va of value is economic, we will never solve these problems. Until we value humanity first, we will endure more on the systemic problems uh, that are around for years. So do you have something to say on that? So... The, the, the driver, the economic driver versus the humanity driver, and we are facing its consequences now. Uh, I would, I mean, spontaneously <clears throat> say I totally agree. I mean, economy needs to be there for hum the human beings. It's not vice versa. We are, we are not here to serve the economy. We, the economy is here to serve human beings. There is a say that, let me think, let me see if I remember it correctly, but that uh, <laughs> the market, for example, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a awful um, master, but it's a good um, servant. And this is how it needs to be, that it needs to be regulated, it needs to serve the people and not vice versa. So I totally agree that it's the human, uh, the humanity and the human need that needs to be prior to, uh, uh, to uh, anything else. But we also know, for example, that um, uh, economic development uh, is important for the next step because economic de development, it's not, uh, it doesn't solve the issues itself. It's what we then do with the, the strong economies that becomes even more important. And therefore, I, I do believe that we need to have an e economies which are inclusive, which, uh, which, uh, which, um, uh, is, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, actually addressing the needs of the people and which all the people in the country uh, con can contribute of, not only um, serve uh, the people who already have very thick uh, wallets. Yeah, and uh, I, I, do, I do, it's a very interesting uh, construct, uh, you know, economics and humanity. Uh, I believe 
the, m- many of the conflicts that we see in terms of opinions and thought processes and debates is when people go too extreme on the on on the spectrum either you go too economic or you you kind of want to go too much on the humane side but then my my thought process always has been can you have a more humane economic model many of the discussions at least for the last two decades or more and the, of course all the conversations and all the philosophies and all the writings that we see uh, everyone understands the benefits of economic model uh, everybody understand that humanity by far hasn't discovered a more efficient way of managing economics but everybody struggles every while all of us feel that the economic model needs to be more inclusive i don't think anyone us any one of us really know how can we make it inclusive because the nature of the market model is in itself makes it difficult to respond to inclusiveness but that being said i have a suggestion here that maybe as the world emerges out of covid and now we believe that maybe things need to be done differently maybe there's a way out for example certainly the world realized that we didn't have enough of ppes we didn't have enough of masks and certainly we realized we didn't have enough, you know even you know enough of basic stuff so when once the logistics and the transportation stop we certainly realized that we don't even have tissue papers forget about anything else and we we wait for five or six months for basics and that's when you realize that this is probably a very fragile way of growing now here in itself there's a there's an example why why were many of those basic supplies uh, blocked for five or six months because uh, as soon as the logistics didn't work it's probably because many of them were sourced from a single country china for example now the, and similarly if you look at vaccines you realize that now the world is probably toying with the idea of concentrating production of vaccines in one large country to kind of trigger the economies of scale which is india now maybe there's a solution here why not pursue that model why not create what i would call it as regional centers or regional concentrations of capacities so maybe china continues to be the manufacturing focus for the world india may become the farmer focus of the world maybe europe certain cluster western europe tries to pick up a different focus eastern focus uh, eastern europe is kind of trying to tries to pick up a different focus maybe that's may, and plus when you pick up some of these economic objectives which are aligned to the skills and the capabilities that is available within the human resource in that particular region then it might be possible that you benefit the world through economies of scale you also benefit different regions of the world by making sure they all get to participate in the larger global growth plus that participation is such that individuals who have the capacities and skills they are able to contribute in, through that particular skill so they they are not disadvantaged maybe there's a way out but uh, once again the question is uh do we have enough critical mass uh in within the leadership to come around and make those decisions i have um uh, i have another point that i want just to ask your your views and your opinion is about employment technology and migration mm-hmm. uh, what is what we are facing today like like this you know this is the way of working now right it's uh, everything on uh, on remotely so Uh, I'm in one part of the world. Each of us, it's in a different part of the world. And and my my question and and concern uh-huh. is how the future of work will be. Because let let me explain. As as we move to technology, many of the services uh, can be done remotely. So w- these will this shape migration? Because for example. You know to work in US I need to have a US working visa but you know remotely I can work for US for a US company but I can live in in Thailand or I can live in Brazil or or in Sweden so how this will impact the workforce and I'm talking to the good and to the bad because of course maybe I can do that just to Uh, avoid uh, regulations to avoid labor loss and this but at the same time how do you use this to develop new people so do, do you have any views on that can i just uh, before i go into that to just say something about growth uh, in the end uh, that was uh, said previously because i believe as i said in the, the intervention just before is um growth is uh, is of course uh, important but it's also equally important what we do with the growth and there that's that's where i see quite huge problems uh, and i see that um many countries are for example 
uh, or it's taxes are being cut after a cut, a cut and cut and cut, uh, which also means that, of course, um, 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 when even of course, when we have a, a, a good growth at the same time as we have a um, good tax system, it also the next step is how do we do it? And this old old lady that I was talking about, for example, she was feeling that uh, her pension is becoming lower, uh, the inequalities are growing, and so on. So as equal uh, equally as. Uh, growth is, it is also the system that we are building on the national levels uh, are, are as important because we need to show, for example, that uh, migration is not a problem. We can take our human responsibility through helping people in need at the same time as we are having good welfare states. So the, the, the systems are, um, I would say, equally important. Then just very short on uh, the issue of work, um, um, I, I think that we need more co cooperation. Um, for example, within European Union also, we need to make sure to have more cooperation that doesn't lead to lower, uh, lower uh, wages when people move. Because one of the important, one of the uh, things, uh, most important things with the European Union is the possibility of, of free movement. And that doesn't only apply for companies, it also applies for people and to be able to work, to be able to study and so on. Um, and those kind of things require also that we have cooperation so that where the wages are high, they are not being pushed down and people are not being used as a, as part of this modern slavery that unfortunately is taking place in some countries. Well, Ricardo, I think uh, uh, that's why I feel that COVID has certainly uh, shown that why some of the old constraints are not valid anymore. I mean, migration was always a pain point because it used to be a competition for jobs. Suddenly, I, and by the way, this right now it's no more an idea. It's already happening. Country, the specific countries which have already offered this, wherein you are welcome to be a citizen of the country as long as you're no, not doing a job in that country. And COVID has shown the world that that's possible. And therefore, suddenly, and that's, that's a classic example where this COVID, the pandemic, and the, suddenly the way we have changed the, our lives, the, our, our delivery models, suddenly it has shown that many of our old concerns are getting invalidated. So yes, chances are today you are welcome to, maybe, maybe you're just 10 years away from the possibility that you are able to live in any country that you want. And you don't have to trouble that country or the leadership in the country because you're not doing you're not taking any jobs from the country in fact you're just investing money because you're buying a house you're buying services so therefore you're actually expanding that economy while not taking away any job from the country so maybe this is possible and that's what i think all of us need to think that when suddenly somebody has come and shaken us all up saying your old ways don't have to be relevant anymore then we should also let go some of our old assumptions and see maybe there's it's very easy to kind of move into a very a more accommodative uh, way of uh, living, perhaps. That's perfect. We are coming up to two minutes. So I want just to uh, hear your, I'm just stepping up here as a moderator, okay, just to make sure we have to go. So sorry, it's just uh, yeah, uh, an impromptu decision here. So uh, I want just to hear your final thoughts uh, on that. So if you can uh, give uh, on the message on going back to stronger together as as and not them. So what would be your final message to those who are listening? And my quick message is stronger together is going to become even more easier thanks to COVID. That's good. And you. Uh, I would say also, I mean, basically the similar and uh, COVID have shown that we need to stick together in order to solve, um, solve uh, the issues and challenges we are standing for. COVID is one, but also the climate change, for example, is another point. This dismantling of a multilateral system and the democracy rule of law and fundamental rights is other things. So the, the we have really, um, the, the past um, years, um, been shown how important cooperation is among people, among states, uh, among regions. Yeah, no, that that's it. So look, I want to to thank you all, okay, for for being uh, uh, here on this panel, and I think this is an absolutely critical uh, point for us. And I think that we need also to go back. I'm I'm recently thinking a lot about go back to what is in our heart and what do we want 
for us as a society, you know, because it, at this time it's so easy to blame others always, you know, saying someone is not doing, but we need to, to have, when you go to the supermarket and buy all stocks of masks, you know, uh, what is the kind of humanity? Because, you know, uh, people are doing that. So even I'm talking in this very simple, basic humanity things. So this is something that we need to think as a group. So thank you very much, okay? Thank you. Have a wonderful day, okay? Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.